Uh, we have another walk with history for you folks, uh, three legends of uh, World War II. Uh, honored to have you gentlemen with us. Uh, and to moderate this session, I'd like to welcome to the podium Owen Rogers from the, Vest, uh, the Veterans History Project, uh, the Library of Congress. So we've worked with them closely over the years in terms of oral history and uh, uh, preserving the legacy of our veterans. So it's great to have you here with us, Owen. And the podium is yours. Please welcome Owen. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Owen Rogers. I'm a liaison specialist with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And that's just a really fancy name for what I believe to be the best job in the world. And to be honest, a labor of love. So what we do is we find ways for American veterans to share their stories, their experiences, and their wisdom with present and future generations. So far, Veterans History Project has collected more than 100,000 veteran stories from every state, every congressional district, and most of the US territories. To be honest, there's more than 21 million living wartime veterans. And although it's the, this is the largest collection of veterans oral histories in the United States, that number is still just a drop in the bucket. And we could truly use your help. The Pew Research Center estimates that 61% of Americans have an immediate family member who has served the United States military since World War II. For the legend in your life, please take the time to sit down and record their story for the permanent collections of the Library of Congress. Your children and your children's children will be able to hear their contributions, read their letters, and look through pictures of events that now, with the World War I centennial in mind, are centuries past. Although I spent the past six years recording, researching, and drawing inspiration from veterans' oral histories, my fascination with their stories began at a young age. When I was a boy, my father was laid off. He began his own business and worked long hours, and sometimes it felt like days passed between our visits. So he started me out on fables as nighttime stories, you know, graduated up to Tolkien, didn't really take, um, but not, and one day he brought home a plastic model of a P-40 Warhawk. So that's one of the most iconic images of the Second World War. And that night, we set up a card table in the kitchen of our apartment, and as I scraped and glued together my little piece of history, he told me the story of Claire Chenault and the Flying Tigers. When the Warhawk was built and hanging from my ceiling, he brought home a B-25 Mitchell. And I remember him comparing the two and telling me the story of the Doolittle Raid and how Army Air Force pilots flew their medium bombers off the pitching flight deck of an aircraft carrier. I like to think that those stories and that bonding experience was the catalyst for me being here today. And I hope you understand why it's such a personal honor to host these three veterans. Today, our experience isn't made of plastic. It's real. If I've learned anything from veterans' oral histories, is that they tell their stories better than we ever could. Our panelists are Richard E. Cole, who flew alongside Jimmy Doolittle in the daring 1942 raid on Tokyo. He's joined by Louis Bravel Jr., a naval aviator who flew missions from the USS Hornet, which I guess puts the two of you in a very special club. And our final panelist is Jerry Yellen, an Army aviator who enlisted two months after the attack on Pearl Harbor and flew throughout the Pacific War, participating in the last mission of World War II. So I'd like to give this time uh, an opportunity for each of the panelists to introduce yourselves and just tell us you know, a little bit about yourselves and really, truly, the legendary qualities that have you sitting us here before us today. Uh, if we could start with you, Mr. Cole. Ah. <laughs> I, now, did you automatically assemble? You look, uh, you're almost alphabetical, but all right. Yeah. I suppose we'll go chronologically. Um, my name is uh, Richard Dick Cole. Uh, in uh, uh, January of 1942, I was assigned to the 17th Bombardment Group at Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, a few days afterwards, uh, we got instructions that we should were moving to Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, uh, we had, uh, up to that point in time, I had uh, very few hours as a a second lieutenant uh, co-pilot in the 34th Bomb Group. Uh, at any rate, we moved to 
uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, were there for two or three weeks. Uh, and a word was passed that they were looking for people to uh, volunteer for a dangerous mission. Uh, the uh, pilot that I was assigned with on the trip from uh, uh, Pendleton to Columbia uh, was a very nice gentleman, and he was a good pilot. Uh, so uh, we teamed up and uh, decided to go on the mission. Uh, a few days into the uh, training of the, the, uh, for the mission, uh, he became ill and uh, had to be disqualified. Yeah. So uh, I was elected to, by the crew to go and talk to the operations officer about uh, uh, the mission. We, we still wanted to go. Uh, uh, the operations officer was uh, uh, in his office, and uh, I reported into him, and he uh, told him that the crew was still one to go. Uh, yeah, he said, well, uh, uh, I'll match you up with the old man, and uh, uh, you can be your pilot. If you do okay, well, you got yourself a pilot. Uh, and I thought to myself, uh, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> we get to fly with an old man. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, Colonel Doolittle arrived. And uh, um, he came in at the office and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, we didn't get to meet him at that time, but uh, uh, the uh, ops officer said, well, uh, you, you, now you know who you're going to be hooked up with and what you're going to do. Uh, but I, uh, and uh, uh, Doodle had, brought, had another um, um, co-pilot that uh, uh, he was going to use. I, I think he was a friend of the, uh, the boss. And, but uh, that gentleman had some kind of a misfortune uh, and uh, couldn't show up. Uh, so uh, that's how we ended up with the, uh, uh, the boss. Uh, okay, we called him several names. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> Uh, he, he right away, uh, 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 as we uh, introduced himself, uh, he, in about 45 minutes after that, uh, we were on our way to Lakeland, Florida. Uh, uh, we went to Florida with him and uh, uh, he spent the night talking with some people at the airport there. The next morning, uh, we were on our way to Wright Field. And, so, and, uh, well, we pardon me, to Mr. Wright Cole. Field, uh, and uh, he, he did some business there. And the next morning, we were back down at the Eglin Field. So you can see we were <laughs> not loafing, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, People asked uh, how we got to be uh, on uh, his crew, and uh, uh, the answer to that was that uh, all he did was take the seat of the gentleman that uh, we were crewed up with originally, and uh, we were the excess baggage that uh, went along with it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so each of the three of you share a common bond of, of, of aviation. And so for my next question, I would, I would love it if uh, Mr. Varvel, if you told me about the, when you realized that you wanted to be a pilot. Uh, when did I realize? Oh, uh, 
I'd like to, you know, because you all share that bond, I would love all of you to answer the question. But uh, if we could start with Mr. Varvel and hear about when he really realized, when he looked up in the sky and realized that he wanted to be a pilot, when was that a moment for you? Uh, 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 probably. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, as I was a kid, born and raised in Dayton, Ohio, uh, I was uh, very interested in aviation. Uh, I belonged to the Airplane Model League of America, uh, where we made uh, airplanes powered by uh, rubber bands. Uh, and uh, I used to ride uh, from my house, uh, which was uh, maybe, uh, oh, I never measured it, but uh, uh, about four miles from uh, McCook Field, which is the Army Air Corps first test base. Uh, and uh, I could ride on my bicycle over there and sit on the levee of the Miami River and uh, watch what was going on on an airfield. And consequently, I, uh, that time period, there was, there was quite a bit going on. The first uh, refueling uh, practices, uh, oh, where gotcha. Thank you. they dumped the hose and uh, so forth out of one plane flying uh, above another. And uh, uh, there were a lot of stunt flying and so forth. That, uh, uh, that uh, was a period of time I was pretty well hooked on it aviation, and uh, I made up my mind I was either going to be a, a Army Air Corps pilot or a forest ranger. Yeah. So uh, I tried to direct my uh, 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 <laughs> forward speed to that <laughs> method. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, so, I, uh, oh, so, excuse me, Mr. Cole. Um, so, Mr. Varvel, what what was it like, you know, just to, to be surrounded by all of those roaring engines on on a flight deck? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you please. I would love to hear your experience, you know, from a, from a sailor's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, was born January. My name is Louis Varvel, and I was born January the ninth, nineteen twenty four, and uh, graduated from high school. 1941, on May the 27th, volunteered for the Navy on June the 10th. My mother wouldn't sign because I was a minor, but Daddy signed. And, uh, <laughs> he was just getting rid of me. Uh, and, uh, so I went through boot camp out of San Diego, and then they sent me to Detroit to aviation machinist mate school. And we got out of that about 3rd of December of 41 and sent me over to Norfolk to a receiving station. And uh, Pearl Harbor was on the 7th, and then I was assigned to a dive bombing squadron assigned to the USS Hornet. And it was a new carrier, uh, DB-8 was a squadron number, and uh, uh, we went, uh, I got, went aboard the Hornet and we went on a shakedown cruise and we probably were in the, went down in the new border of the Gulf because we could hear Dallas on the radio real well. And when we got back to Norfolk, they were two B-25s sitting on the dock and there's a big crane after the uh, island on the carrier and they hoisted these B-25s up on the flight deck and uh, took them back out to sea uh, to see if they could fly them off, which they did. And when we stayed there in Norfolk a while and left out and went down through the Panama Canal and up to, up, going up the coast of uh, the Pacific and I don't know where it was, but the destroyer with us was uh, 
something to do with the two of torpedo and this torpedo slid back out of the tube uh, with, a, with a propeller going and it just cut a sailor's stomach out and they brought him over to the Hornet because we had a hospital and uh, he died and we buried him. That's my first funeral at sea and uh, they put the guy in a white canvas bag, a couple of uh, artillery shells and, and had a service and dropped him off in the ocean. Then we got on up to San Diego and got uh, new dive, SBD dive bombers. The old ones we had must have come over with Columbus. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, then from there we went up to San Francisco across the bay up to Alameda Naval Air Station. And when we got there, they uh, had all the planes, all the cars off the streets, and they were not landing these B-25s. And they came down the streets right to the dock, and we hoisted 16 of them up to the flight deck. They had all the spaces just marked out for them. And they had some lines pointed out on the flight deck from where they parked. Well, first of all, they put some cork or something for each wheel to, in the front wheel to be to take off. And uh, the uh, ship was brand new. And uh, we left out of San Francisco, got out to pass the uh, Alcatraz and the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, got out to sea, and they came on the loudspeaker of the ship and said, this ship now is en route to bomb Tokyo. Well, that was kind of surprising. And just, uh, anyhow, then we, after about seven or eight days, we got out northwest of uh, Hawaii, and uh, we met up with the Enterprise and some cruisers. And I think there was about eight or ten ships in the bunch, two aircraft carriers and two or three cruisers and the rest of them destroyers and one oiler. And we just kept heading west. And on uh, April the 18th, uh, I'd finished breakfast and I just walked out on the flight deck when the Nash uh, Nashville was cruiser was right off our port beam. And all of a sudden it just started shooting at something over on the horizon. Uh, and uh, Enterprise launched fighter pilots, fly, fighter planes, and uh, you couldn't even see it was it so far over there. But anyhow, we turned that away too. And uh, we got over there, they had sunk in this uh, jet. A ship, little old ship that, that uh, Yamamata, the Jap general or the Navy guy, had had them all stationed to uh, catch guys like us. And uh, it, we sank it. And uh, But we were still about, what, 150 miles east of where we were supposed to go, but we were getting in that area where Japan's <coughs> land planes could reach us, and we had so few carriers they didn't want to jeopardize them, and uh, so we, we took everything out of the dive, out of the B-25s to lighten them, and had square five gallon cans of gas and put it in and uh, they uh, then we put the fire those I guess they were fire but it looked like the Roman candles in a bundle put some of them in and of course they had the 500 pound bombs <laughs> already on the on the planes and it was, of all the time I was in the Navy, it was the roughest seas. We were taking green water over the bow of the hang, uh, flight deck. And Admiral 
palsy. Long, when he, he had been in the Navy, he said he had never seen that. And uh, of course, they got all the Army pilots and crew out and started launching them. And uh, the ship was going up and down. So they, when the bow started down, they started these bombers down and they started going downhill. And by the time they got out close to the, by the way, it was about a 30 knot wind. I think it almost took the chocks out and it probably <coughs> take off its by itself. But they ran, and then when they got up, that bow, uh, flight deck sort of threw them up in the air also. And all of them got off, but uh, one of them, I think it was the last, second one, forgot to put his flaps down. And when he got out to the end of the ship and he went all the way out of sight, but there's a little bit when the bow come back down, there he was. You could just see him sucking up, up the landing gear and all. But he, props were in the, almost hitting the tips of the water. But that's, they all got off all right. And that's an incredible memory, Mr. Varvel. Pardon? That's an incredible memory. That's just the, and the way you tell the story is just so, you know, it feels like we were there. Now, uh, Captain Yellen, you also served in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Can you describe, um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, your road to becoming an aviator and some of your experiences out in the Pacific? Well, your question was, when did I decide to become a pilot? Absolutely, let's hear it. Uh, uh, at 12.30 on December 7th, I went down to buy a paper in the corner of Maple and Avenue in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, heard about Pearl Harbor. I was 17 years old. And at that moment, I made up my mind I was going to fly fighter planes against the Japanese. And I went to the armory and got all the papers on my 18th birthday, February 15, 1942. I pretty much forced my mother and father to sign the papers. And I enlisted in the Air Corps as an aviation cadet. There aren't too many people who can say they did what they wanted to do in the military. I graduated from flying school in 1943. I was sent to Hawaii to <coughs> P-40s, Troop P-47. And then on March 7th, I landed on Iwo Jima, eight square miles of, ma of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where 90,000 soldiers were fighting each other, 67,000 Marines and 23,000 Japanese, but they weren't on Iwo Jima. They were in <coughs> for the first 30 days until April 7th, we strafed for the Marines. I think it's more important to speak about you than it is about me. When I put the uniform on of the United States military, I made a commitment to my country. I made a commitment to the guys that I served with and they made a commitment to me. You've made that same commitment now. You who are in uniform, or planning to be in uniform. When I was 12 years old in 1936, living in Newark, New Jersey, we had terrible, terrible racial problems in the United States of America. We had religious problems around the world. People were willing to kill other people for what they believed. Now it's 2016, 80 years later. We have terrible racial problems in America. We have people in other countries who are willing to kill for what they believe. But you're here serving your country, our country, my country, in, a, in an age that science has created weapons of mass destruction. The smallest weapon I understand in the American military today smallest nuclear weapon. It's a thousand times bigger than the bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki, on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And if these bombs ever go to war, we're going to destroy the Earth's ability to sustain life. And we, as Americans, in my opinion, are the only nation in the world that can protect the world from nuclear warfare. And you've taken that job on. So it's your life that's more important than the history of what we did. 
I was one of 16 million of us who served. I hated the Japanese all of my life until 1988, when my younger son married the daughter of a kamikaze pilot who was sent to China, and he lived. We became family. I have three Japanese grandchildren. I learned in my 92 years that we are not what we color with the skin, we're not what we believe, we're not the language we talk, that we're all part of the earth, we're all human beings together. And if we don't learn that and use that knowledge, we're going to destroy the earth. And you're the ones who can protect us. That's your job. So you're more important now in the world than I ever was. And I humbly congratulate you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to ask um, any one of you to speak up and say, um, is there a particular message, you know, drawing on your experience in World War II, that you would like to leave to your grandchildren's generation and the next generation of Americans? And any one of you can step up and answer. I, I didn't understand. So um, is there a specific message, uh, experience, or wisdom that you think that you could leave to, to current generations, to your grandchildren's generation, that would help them solve the problems of the 21st century? Well, the best thing is not ever have a war. Amen. It's a total loss of everything, human life, property, uh, no one wants a war except a few idiots, for some reason, they want power over everybody, and uh, one way to be to eliminate those people so the rest of us can have a good life. <laughs> but the Bible says there'll be wars and rumors of war. And it tends to be pretty much the same, right? So we have to be prepared. Uh, the World War II, to me, was better than four years of college. It, and uh, but when I got out, I had the GI Bill, which was the smartest thing the United States government has ever done. And uh, poor old country boys. We had a chance to do what we needed to do to make a living. I, I look back on World War II, and, and in a way, it was one of the most exciting times of my life. I got to see things that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Uh, some of the people I met, uh, I, uh, after the, we launched these planes, well, we got all our planes back up on the flight deck and launched them. My plane landed, and I was running up a catwalk along the port side of the flight deck, chopping each hand. And Admiral Halsey stepped out of the admiral's cabin onto that catwalk, and I ran over him. <laughs> and, uh, that was the case of the second highest naval officer in the Navy in the Pacific being run over by the lowest peon that ever was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he picked himself up. He said, I'm sorry, son. I should watch where I'm going. <laughs> so he was a buddy of mine from then on. <laughs> on January 1, 1941, at the inauguration of the third term of President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he spoke about the four freedoms of America, the freedom of expression, to say anything that you need to say without fear of retribution all over the world, the freedom of worship of any god or no god, 
for all people all over the world. The freedom from want, everyone should have food and shelter, something to do all over the world. And the freedom from fear of being attacked by another country. That's what we serve for then. We're going to elect another president now who's going to have a hand on a nuclear war. And nuclear war scares the, the bedevil out of me. I fear for my grandchildren in Japan, for my grandchildren in, in America. And you are the front line. You in this audience have a responsibility to protect our world now. That's my message. That's what I learned in my 92 years of life. I live my life today like a banker looks at my checking account. Yesterday was a canceled check. Can't spend that again. Today's money in the bank. I can spend what I've got today. I can do something today. And tomorrow's a promissory note. I don't know if I'm going to get tomorrow, nor do we. But you have a responsibility, and I know you'll fulfill it well. That's beautiful. Mr. Cole, uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations? I'm sorry. Uh, what message would you like to leave for, your for future generations? Uh, well, uh, I have thoughts like these gentlemen had and so forth, but uh, uh, in my mind, it uh, all boiled down to the uh, Hey, much better. Uh, it all boiled down to the fact that, uh, number one, uh, uh, I had achieved what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, because uh, Uncle Sam uh, started what they call the Civilian Pilot Training Program. And uh, he paid for my flying lessons, and uh, I uh, was able to uh, become a bona fide pilot. Uh, but to do that, you said to sign a commitment that if there was uh, any kind of a transgression against the United States of America, that uh, you would make yourself available. And uh, when the Japanese uh, attacked uh, Pearl Harbor under uh, uh, most uh, of the population had no idea of why they did it, uh, it became another uh, mystery. Uh, I figured that uh, not knowing really where Japan was at the time, that uh, uh, they broached the problem and took the initiative of to make an attack. Uh, uh, we were going to finish it. And that was my feeling about it. Thank you. I believe we have time for two questions. You in the back? Can you wait for the mic, please? Hello. Okay. Mr. Allen, this question is for you, sir. You said that your daughter, or sorry, that your son married a Japanese woman. How did you overcome, I guess, years of hatred of the Japanese to, um, you know, accept your Japanese daughter-in-law and love her as well as her a family? I was in Japan in 1987. My son had asked us to come to Japan. And he told my wife and I that he and the young lady that we had met wanted to get married. And I saw the faces of the 16 guys that I flew with who were killed, 11 of them over Japan, five of them in accidents. But I had the presence of mind to ask him, uh, what did her father say? And he said, he won't meet me. And I said, would you get married if you don't get the family's position, uh, permission? And he said, we haven't reached that point yet. It took seven months for them 
for Takako Yamakawa and her brothers to come with their father to meet my son. And the father asked my son five questions. He said, how old is your father? He said, 63. Was he in the war? Yes. What did he do? He was a pilot. What did he fly? P-51s. Where? Over Japan. Now, he had three hours in a zero and was shipped to China. And he was one of 500 kamikaze pilots, 498 of them killed themselves. The fellow that he was shipped to China with was killed in a, by B-29 raid. He was the only one who lived. And he went home and told his wife, make the wedding. And she went ballistic. For 43 years, you've been telling me how much you hate the Americans. You never fired a bullet against them. You didn't die for your emperor. Now you want our son, to our daughter, to marry this guy, Gene? And he said, yes. And she said, why? And he said, any man who could fly a P-51 against the Japanese and live must be a brave man. And I want the blood of that man to fly, to flow through the grain, the veins of our grandchildren. And that's how the wedding came about. On, on March 5th, 1988, two days shy of the 43rd anniversary that I landed on Japanese soil, I went to a wedding in Japan. Three days after that, Mr. Yamakawa and I went to a Ryokan, to a very, very big, fancy Ryokan in Shimoda, the tip of the Iza Peninsula. We spoke for three hours uh, through a, a translator. And we discovered that everything about life, religion, spiritual things, education, family, were as important to Americans as they were to the Japanese. And we bonded as family. So that's how that came about. Thank you, sir. One more question, please. Is there another question from the audience? Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been an enlightening experience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Owen, and gentlemen of the panel. If our next panelist would come forward, and while they're doing that, I'd just like to say a few words about uh, Dick Cole uh, and the Doolittle Raid. Yeah. I hope you've all uh, studied some uh, military history about World War II. If you have, or if you don't know about it, uh, the Doolittle Raiders, 80 of them, changed the history of World War II. Um, as was mentioned, uh, as was mentioned, they had to launch about, about them. Just a minute. They had to launch about 200 miles farther out from Japan than planned. Uh, they bombed their sites in Japan, and then because they were low on fuel, uh, they couldn't reach landing strips in China. They reached the coast of China, most of them, and had to bail out in the middle of a fierce thunderstorm. And Dick Cole said when he had never parachuted out of a plane before, and he was so nervous, uh, that when he pulled the ripcord, he gave himself a black eye. Uh, but uh, they, uh, most of them were picked up by, by uh, Chinese uh, who got them to Chongqing. Um, the Japanese retaliated uh, and swept the whole area where the, uh, where the raiders had been and killed about 250,000 Chinese in retaliation for helping them. Um, Colonel Doolittle thought the raid was uh, a failure. Uh, he lost all his aircraft. He thought he would, would be court-martialed. They got home, most of them to the United States, and found out that they were greeted as heroes because they had boosted the morale of the American people so much, and he got the Medal of, of Honor. Aftermath of the story is that um, the Japanese were so shaken up by this raid, it didn't do very much damage, but they thought they were invincible and couldn't be reached by American forces that they changed their whole defense strategy. And they concluded that they had to take the island of Midway uh, in order to prevent this kind of thing happening again. That, of course, brought on the Battle of Midway, which turned out to be a cataclysmic disaster for the Japanese. They lost four of their aircraft carriers. And because of that, the, cha the, the course of the Pacific War changed at that moment in American favor. And that was all done 
by these 80 men of the Dual uh, Raiders. Dick is the uh, only one left now. He's a young, 102 years old, um, gets around speaking engagements and all sorts of uh, charitable events. Uh, truly uh, one of the greatest heroes uh, that I've ever had the pleasure to meet, uh, as are all these gentlemen here for that matter. So uh, let's give them all another round of applause. Panelist here. Next panelist, please. Hey, you, you gentlemen are uh, I, this, after the boys left the ship and bombed Tokyo, the two of the planes did not get in 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 the free China. They were two of them where the Japanese captured eight of the guys. And of those eight, they shot three in the head, starved one to death, and uh, the ones that lived through it, all through the war, neither one of them weighed over 100 pounds. And uh, the, the war took a lot of life in this like the Northampton was a cruiser with us. Uh, Japanese torpedoed, blew the bow off, and 700 men went down with that ship. And uh, my care, I was on the USS Hornet, and uh, I, it was built in a way where it compart compartment watertight and we got sunk. The uh, we couldn't we couldn't take it under tow anymore and save it. And we tried to sink it. And then the Japs came to see, and they put a bunch of. Finally, they got the thing sunk. But there's a high price paid for the freedom we had. And uh, I, I didn't think I would ever think anything of a Jap, but when I found out how they, how those men ran the street, they, they were, came out of it worse than what we did. Starving them, and they, they had no natural resources to fight a war with, and had to import everything. So they did all of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Barbell. Okay. I, I, I,